Chapter 6. Rulers Represent Themselves Liberty cannot be preserved without a general knowledge among the people of that most dreaded and envied kind of knowledge. I mean of the characters and conduct of their rulers. John Adams In the Declaration of Independence, we find the primary argument for establishing government power, to secure the rights of the people. Without some type of protection mechanism in place, criminals will prey on the population without fear of consequences. They'll do as they please to those who are too weak to resist them. In the exact same document, we find the primary argument for limiting or revoking government power to secure the rights of the people. Without some type of protection mechanism in place, criminals will gain control of government and use its power to prey on the population. They'll do as they please to those who are too weak to resist them. They'll never use the power of government to prosecute and punish themselves. The first argument, government can protect us from crime, is still alive and well. In fact, it's drilled relentlessly into every citizen's head from a very early age. However, the second argument, government can actually subject us to crime, has practically disappeared from politically correct conversation. This despite the fact that the threat posed by criminals and government far exceeds any threat posed by common criminals. If there's any doubt, consider the following. Common criminals don't have access to the media, the trust of the masses, or the air of legitimacy given to those who secure a position of authority. Common criminals cannot legally seize our money, destroy the purchasing power of our currency, or control the police and military. They cannot legislate away our rights or reduce our children to debt slaves. They cannot obstruct an inquiry into their crimes from inside the system. They cannot seal documents, confiscate and lose evidence, or appoint their own investigators. Common criminals cannot write laws and selectively enforce them. They cannot disarm millions of their would-be victims, round them up and put them in cages, or worse. They cannot take nations to war, profiting financially and politically from the carnage. Suffice to say, this is why those who created the U.S. government spoke constantly about limiting its power via the Constitution and Bill of Rights. As Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798, too much confidence in our elected leaders' good intentions is the parent of despotism everywhere. It would be a dangerous delusion, he warned, for us to trust those who currently hold power simply because they are, quote, men of our choice. In questions of power, let no more be heard of confidence in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson, Kentucky Resolutions Members of the network have spent the past 100 years doing everything in their power to nurture the dangerous delusion that Jefferson warned us about. Before they can have their way with the world, our rulers must break the chains of the Constitution that bind them down. They don't want to exercise limited government power. They want to exercise the opposite. A War on Freedom Of all the enemies to public liberty, war is perhaps the most to be dreaded. War is the parent of armies. From these proceed debts and taxes. And armies and debts and taxes are the known instruments for bringing the many under the domination of the few. No nation could preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. James Madison In Chapter 1, we briefly covered the 1950s-era investigations into large tax-exempt foundations. Many were shocked when it was discovered that the capitalist foundations were using their money to support communism. At first glance, this seems ridiculous. Why would the wealthiest men in the world want to orient American Far Eastern policies toward communist objectives? This seemingly suicidal policy begins to make more sense when you learn how the network actually operates. It's important to remember that war, and the threat of war, has enabled them, more than anything else, to inch ever closer to their goal of destroying national sovereignty. Norman Dodd was the lead researcher for one of the aforementioned investigations, and as such he was chosen to appoint the committee staff. By the 1950s, propaganda touting the humanitarian benevolence of the tax-exempt foundations was widely accepted, and many people, including one of Dodd's researchers, Catherine Casey, 
felt that the foundations were beyond reproach. As Dodd put it, Casey was, quote, unsympathetic to the purpose of the investigation. Her attitude was, what could possibly be wrong with foundations? They do so much good. But Casey's trust was soon shattered as she dug into what was, at the time, decades-old records of the network-connected Carnegie Foundation. Dot explains, I blocked out certain periods of time for Casey to concentrate on, and off she went to New York. She came back at the end of two weeks with the following on dictaphone tapes. Quote, We are now at the year 1908. In that year, the trustees raised a specific question which they discussed throughout the balance of the year in a very learned fashion. The question, is there any means known more effective than war, assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people? And they conclude that no more effective means than war to that end is known to humanity. So then, in 1909, they raised the second question and discussed it. Namely, how do we involve the United States in a war? Then finally, they answered that question as follows. We must control the State Department. That very naturally raises the question of how do we do that? And they answer it by saying, we must take over and control the diplomatic machinery of this country. And finally, they resolve to aim at that as an objective. Now, keep in mind, the plans that Casey's reporting on were originally written just a few years before the network managed to gain control of the diplomatic machinery of the country, using Woodrow Wilson and Edward Mandel House. That control was later expanded via the network-led group of experts known as the Inquiry. The Inquiry, in turn, evolved into what is now known as the Council on Foreign Relations. Within 20 years of its founding, the CFR's enormous power within the State Department was undeniable. Look no further than the 1939 War and Peace Studies for an excellent example. Casey's report continues. Then time passes, and we are eventually in a war, which would be World War I. At that time, they record on their minutes a shocking report in which they dispatch to President Wilson a telegram cautioning him to see that the war does not end too quickly. Finally, of course, the war is over. At that time, their interest shifts over to preventing what they call a reversion of life in the United States to what it was prior to 1914 when World War I broke out. At that point, they came to the conclusion that, to prevent a reversion, we must control education in the United States. They realize that that's a pretty big task. They then decide that the key to success lay in the alteration of the teaching of American history. According to Norman Dodd, Casey was so devastated by the information she uncovered during the Reese Committee investigation that she never recovered. He stated, quote, As far as its impact on Catherine Casey was concerned, she never was able to return to her law practice. Ultimately, she lost her mind as a result of it. It was a terrible shock. It's a very rough experience to encounter proof of these kinds. That final sentence is profound. It actually is a very rough experience to encounter proof that you've been intentionally misled. It is painful to learn that intelligent, manipulative, and arrogant liars have secured your well-meaning trust only then to play you as a fool. Nobody wants to face that feeling, and as it relates to our powerful institutions, that feeling gets worse before it gets better. After discovering the initial betrayal, you come to realize that your trust has been betrayed at every turn. You realize that the entire system has been designed to deceive and trap you, along with the rest of the unsuspecting public, in a fabricated reality, in an illusion. Perhaps worst of all, after some study and serious thought, you begin to comprehend the enormity of the problem. The same institutional propaganda that initially fooled you still holds sway over millions and millions of minds. To unlock those minds, you must convince people to investigate ugly truths that to them seem ridiculous and offensive. You have to overcome the fact that most people will be unsympathetic to the purpose of any investigation that challenges their deeply held beliefs. Catherine Casey uncovered a criminal conspiracy that was so inherently immoral and so at odds with popular perception that few people would ever believe the story was true. And since we don't have access to the documents she saw, 
healthy skepticism is perfectly reasonable. So, moving forward, let's assume that all we have to go on is a few general assertions. First, members of the network believe they have a right to rule in secrecy. Second, by controlling policy and public perception, they have the ability to do so. And third, because of their power within the political system, their crimes are rarely exposed and never properly punished. Throughout the remainder of this book, I will prove that these three assertions are true. Operation Northwoods Like Catherine Casey, my worldview changed forever when I stumbled across a document that I was never supposed to read. Coincidentally, the secret document I saw also pertained to war, specifically a plan to involve the United States in a war by convincing its citizens, its government, and its military that the nation had been attacked. The ugly truth, that the attack was to be an inside job, would be known only to a handful of individuals at the apex of power. Its success, like nearly everything the network does, would rest on the exploitation of humanitarian impulses and the betrayal of public trust. To really understand how easy it is for the network to deceive a trusting public, let's begin with a thought experiment. Imagine the following hypothetical scenario. The President of the United States appears on national television and announces that Iran has shot down a civilian airliner filled with 200 American students. There are no survivors. The only thing that remains of the plane, its passengers, and its crew is the frantic tape of the pilot's final transmission. Mayday! Mayday! We're being tailed by an Iranian fighter! We need help up here and fast! Mayday! Do you copy? Followed by the sound of an explosion, frantic screams, and then silence. As the media plays the chilling audio over and over again, pausing periodically to interview grieving parents who have lost their children, the president assures the horrified and outraged public that the United States will act both swiftly and decisively. He says, quote, We will not sit idly by as our nation's children are murdered in cold blood. This crazed and arrogant Iranian regime has been tolerated long enough and it will now be brought to justice. I've instructed the Secretary of Defense to have a preliminary course of action prepared and on my desk by morning. Now, in this hypothetical scenario, very few people would have any desire whatsoever to stop the looming military confrontation. Quite the contrary. Having been properly whipped into an emotional frenzy, they would cheer the retaliatory strike every step of the way. Even those who did question the wisdom and potential consequences of a war with Iran would be unlikely to speak up. They'd only be shouted down by an angry, media-driven mob if they did. And this is all basic human psychology. It's perfectly predictable. Equally predictable are the odds of anyone having any patience for an alternative narrative, especially a narrative that shifts blame from the well-established villain, Iran, to the well-meaning hero the U.S. government. If you doubt this, just imagine some conspiracy nut standing up and stating the following. It's all a lie. Iran is innocent. Our government was behind the whole thing. They loaded a civilian airliner with fake passengers, flew the plane to a secret location, unloaded the fake passengers, and replaced the original plane with a remote-controlled drone. They created a fake Iranian fighter jet. It was really an American fighter painted to look like an Iranian fighter and had it chase after the remote-controlled drone. Then, they transmitted a fake mayday signal from the drone just before blowing it up. It was all a setup so we could frame and attack Iran. What percentage of the trusting public could believe that their government would conspire to do something so utterly ridiculous and insane? Probably 0%. Unless, of course the trusting public's understanding of how their government actually operates was revealed to them via some shocking proof. Some shocking proof that the conspiracy nut was right. Well, substitute Iran for Cuba, and you've got a nearly perfect description of the Northwoods document. The Northwoods document was an official U.S. government plan to manipulate the people into supporting an unnecessary and illegal war. In the document... Its authors propose many pretexts to achieve their aim, everything from creating a terror campaign in the United States 
to having covert U.S. agents carry out attacks against U.S. targets and then blaming Cuba for the attacks. It even speaks of completely fabricating an attack by using fake planes, fake passengers, remote-controlled drone aircraft, a faked mayday call, and a faked shoot-down. Sound unbelievable? It did to me as well, but then I read it for myself. Here's the related text, excerpted directly from the Northwoods document. Quote, As requested by Chief of Operations, Cuba Project, the Joint Chiefs of Staff are to indicate brief but precise description of pretexts which they consider would provide justification for U.S. military intervention in Cuba. All projects are suggested within the time frame of the next few months. It is possible to create an incident which will demonstrate convincingly that a Cuban aircraft has attacked and shot down a chartered civil airliner. The passengers could be a group of college students off on a holiday or any grouping of persons with a common interest to support chartering a non-scheduled flight. An aircraft at Eglin Air Force Base would be painted and numbered as an exact duplicate for a civil registered aircraft belonging to a CIA proprietary organization. At a designated time, the duplicate would be substituted for the actual civil aircraft and would be loaded with selected passengers, all boarded under carefully prepared aliases. The actual registered aircraft would be converted to a drone. Takeoff times of the drone aircraft and the actual aircraft will be scheduled to allow a rendezvous south of Florida. From the rendezvous point, the passenger carrying aircraft will descend to minimum altitude and go directly into an auxiliary field of Eglin Air Force Base, where arrangements will have been made to evacuate the passengers and return the aircraft to its original status. The drone aircraft, meanwhile, will continue to fly the filed flight plan. When over Cuba, the drone will begin transmitting on the international distress frequency a mayday message stating that he is under attack by Cuban MiG aircraft. The transmission will be interrupted by destruction of the aircraft, which will be triggered by radio signal. This will allow ICAO radio stations in the Western Hemisphere to tell the U.S. what has happened to the aircraft, instead of the U.S. trying to sell the incident. Immediately prior to this proposal, the document suggests having U.S. military pilots threaten civilian aircraft with fake MiG-type aircraft. This presumably would make a later shoot-down that much more believable. Quote, An F-86 properly painted would convince air passengers that they saw a Cuban MiG, especially if the pilot of the transport were to announce such fact. Reasonable copies of the MiG could be produced from U.S. resources in about three months. As noted, these plans were drafted in support of the larger Cuba project which was essentially a CIA-directed covert operation against Cuba. The Cuba project contained many other equally immoral and dishonest proposals. One such proposal involved having the United States attack Jamaica and then blame the attack on Cuba. From Wikipedia, quote, Included in the nations, the Joint Chiefs suggested as targets for covert attacks were Jamaica and Trinidad-Tobago. Since both were members of the British Commonwealth, the Joint Chiefs hoped that by secretly attacking them and then falsely blaming Cuba, the United States could incite the people of the United Kingdom into supporting a war against Castro. A plan was even put forward that suggested bribing a Cuban commander to launch an attack against the U.S. military base at Guantanamo Bay. As James Bamford notes, the act suggested bribing a foreign nation to launch a violent attack on an American military installation was treason. It's imperative to understand that covert operations of this nature rely on the ignorance of both the public and the vast majority of government and military personnel. The whole point of a covert operation is to deceive, to get away with something you would otherwise be unable to get away with. Regarding these and other proposals, a Department of Defense report stated clearly, quote, if the decision should be made to set up a contrived situation, it should be one in which participation by U.S. personnel is limited only to the most highly trusted covert personnel. This suggests the infeasibility of the use of military units for any aspect of the contrived situation. As part of the Cuba project, Operation Northwoods was approved through the highest chain of command, all the way up to the President of the United States.
Fortunately, President Kennedy's opinion of the CIA and its tactics had already soured by the time the document hit his desk, and he rejected it. If he hadn't, this plan would have no doubt led to an unnecessary war and the death of many thousands based on total lies. Even worse, it could have easily led to a nuclear exchange with Russia and millions dead based on lies. A quick side note here. Kennedy's negative opinion of the network-created CIA is summed up nicely in the following quote. I want to splinter the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. Many people, for good reason, believe the CIA played a direct role in both the murder of JFK and the cover-up that followed. That topic's beyond the scope of this audiobook. However, just for reference, books like JFK and the Unspeakable do an excellent job of revealing the power struggle that emerged between Kennedy and his foreign policy advisors once he began moving the nation's foreign policy in an unapproved direction. When I first read Operation Northwoods, I was still like Catherine Casey, terribly naive. In my imaginary world, any individual who conspired to facilitate terrorist attacks against the United States would be viewed as a terrorist and punished severely. Any group of public servants who set out to frame another nation for a crime it didn't commit, kill innocent people, and deceive the nation into an illegal war would be brought up on charges and thrown in prison for a very long time. But as I searched for information on how these conspirators were held accountable, I found nothing. No charges, no trials, no punishment. It was as if deception, murder, and even treason were all acceptable just so long as the crimes were committed at the behest of the most powerful members of society. It didn't look anything like the justice, freedom, and democracy that I learned about in school. And as I dug deeper, it only got worse. Much worse. In 1998, Daniela Ganser was looking for a Ph.D. research topic, and against the advice of his friends and professors, he decided to tackle the gigantic task of unraveling Operation Gladio. Beginning with a single document that proved the CIA and NATO created a secret terrorist army in Italy, he embarked on a four-year investigation that uncovered an additional 15 secret armies in NATO countries, and four more that were created in neutral countries. There are many well-known lies about the nature of our leaders and what they're capable of. The most obvious lie, to those who are paying attention, is that they respect national sovereignty, democracy, and the will of the people. Nothing could be further from the truth, and Operation Gladio provides an excellent case in point. Gladio also underscores two key arguments that I've put forward in this book, which are, number one, the network has mastered the art of pursuing its sovereignty destruction project while maintaining the illusion of democracy, and two, its members operate above the moral and legislative laws that others are expected to abide by. To address these points properly, we must first expand on some of the network's handiwork prior to its implementation of Gladio following World War II. Unfortunately, because there's so much ground to cover, Gladio is going to have to wait until Chapter 8. World War I, The League of Nations, and Debt Traps by manipulating the election of 1912, the network brought Woodrow Wilson to power and effectively gained control of the diplomatic machinery of the United States. If, as Catherine Casey reported, the ultimate aim was to maneuver the United States into a war capable of altering the life of an entire people, the network was well on its way. All it needed now was the war itself, and as luck would have it, Europe was already a powder keg that was primed and ready to explode. Henry Kissinger explains the political climate that preceded World War I this way. The astonishing aspect of the First World War is that it took so long for it to happen. The statesmen of all the major countries had helped to construct a diplomatic doomsday mechanism. The unholy mix of general political alliances and hair-trigger military strategies guaranteed a vast bloodletting. Foreign policy now consisted of gambling on a single throw of the dice. A more mindless and technocratic approach to war would have been difficult to imagine. In June 1914, 
the so-called Black Hand, reached into Europe and set the doomsday mechanism into motion by assassinating Franz Ferdinand. The vast bloodletting followed shortly thereafter, and lo and behold, the network had its war. Now, it was simply a matter of dragging the war on long enough for their carefully selected puppet, Woodrow Wilson, to sell his divinely inspired plan for U.S. intervention and a new world order. With the carnage of World War I as a backdrop, and with the father of propaganda, Edward Bernays, at his side, Wilson began stirring support for the League of Nations that he'd been writing about since at least 1887. Following his plan, the world would be led into a new and peaceful era where all nations, great and small, would be protected from unjust aggression and the violation of their sovereignty. Touting American principles, Wilson declared in May 1916, quote, We believe these fundamental things. First, that every people has a right to choose the sovereignty under which they shall live. Second, that the small states of the world have a right to enjoy the same respect for their sovereignty and for their territorial integrity that great and powerful nations expect and insist upon. And third, that the world has a right to be free from every disturbance of its peace that has its origin in aggression and disregard of the rights of people and nations. This lofty rhetoric, coupled with the outrage of a so-called surprise attack on the passenger liner Lusitania, more on that later, allowed the network to steadily move the United States toward entering the European conflict. As it had done with the Federal Reserve System and income tax, the network skillfully manipulated public opinion until it overcame the nation's strong anti-war sentiment. World War I, the people were assured, was a war that would end all wars. It would, quote, make the world safe for democracy and lead mankind into a new era of respect for the rights of man. It was the duty of every liberty-loving citizen of the United States to support it, because no moral human could possibly oppose such ends. Of course, if the utopian carrot wasn't enough, the network also had a stick in its back pocket that it used to great effect. One week after a German torpedo sunk the Lusitania, killing nearly all Americans on board, Professor Nock informs us, quote, Americans barely had the chance to digest this assault when the British government released an official report on German atrocities, bearing the name of Viscount James Bryce, the esteemed former ambassador to the United States. Bryce was a member of what Quigley referred to as the second generation of the network's Cecil Block. The crescendo of a systematic propaganda campaign to overcome American neutrality, this document cataloged in the most lurid detail some 1,200 alleged acts of barbarism and cruelty committed by German soldiers, primarily against Belgians, including the crucifixion and decapitation of prisoners of war, the gang rape and sexual mutilation of women, the hacking off of children's fingers for souvenirs, and the bayonetting of infants. Although much of it was later proved to be fictional, Germany would never fully recover from the revulsion that swept the United States. This carrot-and-stick propaganda campaign produced the desired result. The United States eventually entered the war, and a constitutional abomination known as the Espionage Act was used to silence any remaining skeptics and dissenters. Apparently making the world safe for democracy meant demonizing and jailing U.S. citizens who continued to voice their opposition. Opposition disrupted the campaign to establish patriotic conformity, and so it could not be tolerated. But the skeptics and dissenters were inevitably vindicated. At the war's end, the reality of power politics reared its ugly head. Quigley explains, the peoples of the victorious nations had taken to heart their wartime propaganda about the rights of small nations, making the world safe for democracy, and putting an end both to power politics and to secret diplomacy. These ideals have been given concrete form in Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. The defeated powers had been promised that the peace settlements would be negotiated and would be based on the 14 points. When it became clear that the settlements were to be imposed rather than negotiated, that the terms of the settlements have been reached by a process of secret negotiations from which the small nations have been excluded and in which power politics played a much larger role than the safety of democracy, there was a revulsion of feeling against the treaties. 
Though the peoples of the victorious nations might have felt betrayed, members of the network had plenty of reasons to celebrate. Up to this point, they had achieved nearly every one of their aims, from the Wilson coup in 1912 to the Federal Reserve System and Income Tax, from maneuvering the United States into war to creating a League of Nations that they would ultimately control. However, it was on this final point, the League of Nations, where the network came up short. When Wilson was forced to admit that the United States would have to cede sovereignty in order for the League to work, opposition within the U.S. Senate began to grow. In an attempt to overcome this opposition, he delivered yet another one of his messianic speeches in July 1919. The League of Nations, Wilson declared, was, quote, the indispensable instrumentality for the maintenance of the new order. Dare we reject it and break the heart of the world? The stage is set, the destiny disclosed. It has come about by no plan of our conceiving, but by the hand of God who led us into this way. We cannot turn back. We can only go forward with lifted eyes and freshened spirit to follow the vision. It was of this that we dreamed at our birth. America shall in truth show the way. The light streams upon the path ahead and nowhere else. But no amount of lofty rhetoric or appeals to emotion would suffice. The League would clearly undermine U.S. sovereignty, and Wilson was unable to rally enough support within the Senate to overcome this objection. In November 1919, after months of debate, the U.S. Senate voted not to join. However, this isn't to suggest that the network's efforts had been in vain. A great deal of money had been made during the war. Competing empires had been destroyed. Power had been consolidated. And dozens of nations had joined the League. The network simply had some more work to do within the United States. And more work it did. Aside from increasing its control over government using the Inquiry, the CFR, and other well-connected instruments, it also began increasing its financial control with its new monetary weapon, the Federal Reserve System. Stealing Gold and Creating Debt After World War I, the Federal Reserve began artificially inflating the U.S. dollar supply. Quigley informs us that this was done in large part to allow gold to be drained from the United States for Britain's benefit without triggering a corresponding reduction in the number of U.S. dollars in circulation. The newly printed Fed money flowed into the stock market, inflated the bubble of the Roaring Twenties, and inevitably led to the stock market crash of 1929 and the economic devastation of the Great Depression. This, too, helped to, quote, alter the life of an entire people. Making economic matters worse, Britain went off the gold standard completely in 1931, and this predictably intensified the depletion of U.S. gold. Nations that could no longer redeem their paper receipts for gold in Britain now turned to the United States. Since the U.S. was the only gold standard country with gold coins still circulating, gold poured out of the country. Additionally, concerned U.S. citizens began redeeming large quantities of their dollars for gold too, and the U.S. banking system began to collapse. This pressure on the banking system continued until 1933 when the network convinced President Roosevelt, FDR, to confiscate U.S. citizens' gold and hand it over to the Federal Reserve. By making it illegal for U.S. citizens to redeem their dollars in gold, the Federal Reserve, in cooperation with policymakers within the federal government, could now begin printing ever larger piles of debt money while increasing their own power in the process. As covered in Chapter 4, a heavily indebted government is much easier to control than one that is financially sound. Even Quigley admits that making gold illegal in the United States wasn't necessary. He states that it was done, quote, in order to pursue a policy of price inflation. It was not made necessary by the American international financial position. It's also worth noting that Edward Mandel House, more than 20 years after advising Woodrow Wilson, was an advisor to FDR as well. If the network always seeks to trap nations in debt, and it does, then a review of the growth in U.S. federal debt should be instructive. And it is. In the 20 years prior to Wilson's election, the amount of debt the federal government owed increased by just $1.3 billion. In the 20 years after Wilson's election, 
the amount of debt the federal government owed increased by nearly $20 billion. This massive increase in debt occurred despite the additional revenue provided by the 1913 personal income tax. But even this $20 billion increase was just a drop in the bucket. Fast forward to just after FDR's presidency, and the federal debt had increased by more than $240 billion. And in 2012, it had increased by more than $16 trillion. This information on government debt is vitally important because it plays a major role in the network's destruction of national sovereignty. Financial warfare is essential, and the basic recipe for conquering a nation financially can be summed up in two simple steps. First, create shortfalls in government revenue either by increasing the amount of money a government spends, decreasing the amount of money a government collects, or both. And second, create loans out of thin air to help the leaders cover their spending shortfalls without correcting the underlying financial imbalance. As payments on mounting debt create greater and greater shortfalls, and as annual spending continues to increase unabated, larger and more frequent loans become necessary to bridge the gap. This accelerates the rate at which the national debt grows, and before long, even powerful nations will find themselves utterly dependent on a constant flow of newly borrowed funds to cover their expenses. Once a nation has been trapped in this way, the network can simply adjust the financial spigot according to the level at which its desires are being met. If a government wants to maintain vital services, social order, and ultimately its own power, it will do what the network wants regardless of the will of the people. If the government refuses, the flow of money will be cut and won't be restored until, quote, more acceptable leaders assume control. And as we'll cover in the next chapter, acceptable has nothing to do with how the new leaders treat the citizens that live beneath them.